Good morning, and my thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work. I'm going to start with my conclusions, which are as follows. Um, that on current patterns, there will be a billion smoking deaths this century, of which uh, 250 million deaths will occur just among people below age 35 in just 16 countries. I will talk briefly about other risks, particularly alcohol um, and other substance abuse, but I want to focus my main messages around smoking. The other key messages are that prolonged smoking, as we've recently, only recently documented, means about a loss of a decade of life, but that cessation, particularly by age 40 or preferably earlier, is uh, remarkably effective. And then I'll talk a little bit about the strategies, particularly taxation, as the best way to reduce this uh, enormous total of, uh, of deaths in the future. So as an epidemiologist, I will be giving you lots of numbers, and I apologize for that at the outset. You know, the criticism of epidemiologists is that we're number crunchers like accountants. That's not quite fair. Accountants have more personality. Uh, <laughs> Let's start with some of the big numbers, which I'm sure you've heard um, from presentations by Richard uh, Pito, which are really that on current smoking patterns, there will be about a billion smoking deaths in this century, in contrast to only 100 million in the last century, and that much of the increase is going to occur in low- and middle-income countries. And this is chiefly driven by not just population growth, but by successive generations of smokers uh, being re that didn't smoke so much or started late in life being replaced by those that are starting earlier in life and um, having more smoking. So in terms of global comparisons, the, there are large numbers of substance users or abusers worldwide. So smoking, about 1.3 billion People currently smoke above age 15. Drinking, any type of drinking, is about 2 billion. Illicit drugs, as estimated by WHO, is about uh, 200 million. And the estimates of the numbers of deaths are shown here. And clearly, smoking is a, uh, the leading cause of death among the substance abuse. If you take into account disability or societal harm, then this scenario is actually quite different, particularly for alcohol and as um, Chief Christian has outlined, in particular populations, drinking and illicit drugs can be quite important. But the big numbers globally really are around smoking and worldwide sales of cigarettes in billions of sticks have gone from 5,000 billion or 5 trillion up to 6 trillion. And you can think about it that every million sticks of tobacco, million sticks of cigarettes lead to about one death. So let's look at the individual level in terms of contrasting these risks. And addiction is a complex phenomenon, as we'll hear in the, I'm sure, in the next session. It involves different neurologic processes, but also social processes. But quite broadly, the risks of addiction for smoking are as great as they have been shown for alcohol or even for opiate, uh, opiate use. And importantly, unlike other youthful excesses that you can think of. And lots of people are binge drinkers as children or as ad, uh, young adolescents, and they might do fast driving or experiment. But generally, they involve some kind of learning in which you end up, as most drinkers are, as modest drinkers. In contrast, there is, not youth, there is no learning from smoking. You don't learn to be a safer smoker by being a childhood smoker. The risk of death is, of course, much greater. If you take 1,000 male smokers age 20 in a typical low- and middle-income country, you would have about 250 die from smoking in middle age, 20 die from road accidents or violence, 30 of which, or 30 additional from all alcohol-related conditions. Again, this might vary in particular populations, but overall the risks are greater. But let's turn briefly to alcohol as a major cause of death. Now, worldwide, in most populations, smoking does kill more than drinking. Russia is different, and one of the key messages around alcohol is don't drink like a Russian. <laughs> the, if you see the patterns, for example, of all-cause mortality 
in ages 15 to 54. The United Kingdom, over a 30-year period, had steady declines. Russia had high levels right at the outset. Now, prior to 1980, this excess between the UK and the US, or UK and Russia, is really due to smoking. But the changes since 1980 are really due to alcohol. And you can see this very clearly in the big changes that are either respond to decreases in alcohol consumption that, for example, Mr. Gorbachev brought in, or the collapse that occurred and Mr. when Mr. Yeltsin came in. He also sold Yeltsin vodka. And you can see this remarkably in the study by David Zaritze that showed the excess death rates from Russian male patterns. And here the comparison was not of non-drinkers. They couldn't find any non-drinkers in the places they studied. So the comparison is of those that had only half a bottles a week. That's about 20 shots a week was the control group. And a bottle a day was the exposure group. And they had much greater risks, including of medical causes of death, of which a large excess was um, acute coronary, uh, acute coronary conditions leading to death. Okay, uh, some people have been arguing that obesity and particularly food should also be considered an addiction. It's important to know what are the differences in smoking and obesity risks. Well, as I'll show you, we know now that smoking involves about a decade of life lost for prolonged smoking. This is first de demonstrated only in 2005 by uh, the late Richard Dahl. In contrast, for obesity, you have, for most levels of modest obesity, which is the main concern, main public policy concern, you have about a three-year loss of life lost. Only if you get very high BMI, in this case around 43, or in personal terms it would mean I would have to gain 50 kilograms to have that kind of BMI, and that would be the equivalent of being a typical smoker. Moreover, we know what to do about smoking. We know less about how to get adults to lose weight. Well, remarkably, the only in October of last year was there evidence from the UK, US, Japan, and Indian about the effects of prolonged smoking in different populations of men and women. And almost all of these showed a doubling or tripling of risk between smokers and non-smokers, and that corresponds to about a decade of life lost. And that decade of life loss is, on average, it combines a zero loss for some smokers with a much greater loss than 10 years for many other smokers. And even among Indian men that smoke cigarettes, you already see about a decade of life lost. And good news and bad news on the smoking front from the New England Journal of Medicine they state flat out smokers lose at least one decade of life expectancy over non-smokers on average. The encouraging news here is quitting before 40 reduces the smoking-related death risk by 90% compared to continuing on as a smoker. So there's Brian Williams doing 60 years of epidemiology in 22 seconds. <laughs> so our results of... Uh, from the U.S. were uh, important because this relates also to how do you measure the causes of death. In the U.S. there's this remarkable uh, system called the National Death Index where you can do population surveys and link them to mortality. I would like to call this death book. It's like the Facebook of death. And the key findings from this study that we did surveying about 200,000 people and following them up for about seven years was that women and men were both about three times likely to to die, and that the risks now for women are as mature as those for, for men. And this is expressed not just in the relative risks, but in the probability of reaching age 80. It's a fair proposition to think you're not going to live forever, but you can reach age 80 in reasonably good health. And there's a remarkable difference now already among American women between those that smoke only 38% of those on average will reach age 80, versus those that don't, 70% will, leading to a decade of life lost. And it's exactly uh, comparable for men. Okay, because the risks of smoking are so big, the benefits of quitting are also very large. Those that quit by age 30 are close to never smoker rates. Those that quit by age 40 on average get about nine of the 10 years back that they would have lost. Quit by 50, get six years back. Quit by 60, get four years back. 
Now let's turn to the developing countries where we have only recently had evidence on the evolution of the epidemic. And one of the key findings is really relates to the large numbers of adults or those below age 35 that live just in a handful of countries, 16 countries, I guess it's three or four hands actually, but 16 countries constitute a large number of the world's uh, smokers. About half a billion of these will smoke or are currently smoking. And for these populations below age 35, we can safely say that they can expect a full decade of life lost. And that would mean something like 250 million deaths just among these populations. You can see this very clearly in China, where sm Chinese smoking basically followed 40 years after the US trends in terms of numbers of cigarettes smoked. And uh, that's been mostly confined to Chinese men. Very few Chinese women smoke. In 1950, 12% of all US deaths adult deaths were due to smoking. That rose to 33%. China is on its way to doing the same just 40 years later. In India, there are already about a million smoking deaths a year. And there are large differences, particularly between smoking of the Western cigarette and the locally manufactured small cigarette, which is called the BD. Hop over next door to Bangladesh, and you can find that already there's a seven-year loss of life. This will mature likely to about 10 years based upon the 2012 evidence that we have, but it's already uh, at seven years of life lost. Okay, let's talk about interventions that can decrease consumption, the most important of which is to get taxes raised. Taxes in particular are effective among the poor and in the youth. There's a set of other interventions that are important involving information, warning labels, but I'll mostly talk about taxes. We have good evidence from over 100 studies that of a very strong relationship of price and consumption. Uh, overall, about a 10% higher price leads to about 2 to 4% of current smoke, uh, smokers to quit and 2 to 4% don't start. So that re reflects a price elasticity of about minus 0.4, uh, as the economists call them. And interestingly, you find the same price elasticity for other addictive goods in non-human uh, studies, in primate studies, with various addictive goods. It and might suggest that we've got a built-in price responsiveness to most addictive goods. So what does this mean when you apply it? Well, uh, in South Africa, there was a large increase in price such that the real price tripled as a result of increases in the excise tax, and consumption fell by half. You know, went from about five cigarettes per adult or about four per adult per day down to about two in a reasonably rapid time frame. And the same in France. In France, they were able to decrease consumption from six cigarettes per adult per day down to three in only 15 years as a result of this large increase in price that uh, President Jacques Chirac brought in. By contrast, in Canada, it took us 35 years to go from about 11 cigarettes per adult per day down to about five. So you can have consumption much faster with price instruments than uh, using other types of tobacco control interventions. And you see this very clearly in the French effects on mortality. In Prior to 1997, there was two stories emerging. In the UK, lung cancer deaths at young ages, which is a good measure of recent exposure to smoking, was substantially decreasing, and female epidemic was not going up. By contrast, in France, it was going up, and both in men but also in women. But after 1997, when the price effects uh, had taken place, France had a substantial decline in lung cancer in men and also a plateauing in women. Now, some of this is related to the changes in the type of cigarette, but mostly it's decreased consumption. However, excise taxes are vastly underused in most low- and middle-income countries. Margaret Chan from WHO wrote recently about the good news that now about 2 billion people in the world are covered by some kind of tobacco control uh, legislation or efforts. Uh, versus a billion just uh, five years ago, but the progress on taxes has actually been really minimal, that worldwide high-income countries have about half of the street price 
comprised of excise tax. In Canada, we're higher and varies by province. But in low-income countries, it's about a third. And this ex explains, in part, the big differences that you see in price, even when you adjust for uh, what's called purchasing power or differences in uh, the economic and exchange rates. Well, what are the main objections to tobacco control? Um, one of the most important ones is that smoking and tobacco taxation, smoking controls and tobacco taxation hurt the poor or don't have an impact on the poor. And that's simply not true. There's some very important data that are coming out from Canada, which has used price and non-price interventions pretty, pretty aggressively, such that we've had about a million more ex-smokers in the last decade um, as a result of these interventions. And the poor are not getting left behind in Canada. So these are data from Census Canada stratified by the neighborhood income in the urban areas. And if you look at the poorest men, their probability of dying between 35 to 69 is shown here. And the proportion of that, which is due to smoking, has substantially fallen. Now, it is lower in the richest income of, uh, of men, but the absolute declines are comparable between poorest and richest. And if you put this together, the inequalities in mortality in Canada have narrowed as a result of uh, smoking controls. Okay, I've talked mostly about taxes, but I do want to emphasize there are other important interventions, one of which are prominent warning labels that Canada has been a pioneer in, and this appears to have an impact. But I believe the next generation of thinking really is around what Australia has done, which is called the plain packaging, which involves removing all trademarks except for the name of the brand in plain packages with health warnings on the on the. Uh, back, and early evidence suggests that this, in fact, has also increased cessation attempts. In conclusion, I'd like to come back to talking about the big numbers. Yes, globally, alcohol, other substance abuse are important, and they are uh, variable in different populations, but by the most important metric of absolute numbers of deaths and avoidable deaths, smoking uh, is in a league of its own. There will be a billion smoking deaths. We know now, just in the last year, we're looking at about a hazard of uh, a decade loss for a typical smoker, but cessation is ridiculously effective. At, uh, quitting by age 40 and much uh, preferably earlier would avoid at least 90% of the excess risk. Tripling taxes is the most important intervention that we can do. And I didn't speak much about the importance of monitoring, but it is, it is politically and scientifically important. The effects of the epidemic change decade to decade, and they differ between men and women, as we've just shown recently for the United States. So simple strategies that can enable the monitoring of the epidemic are needed. And the studies that I showed you from India and Bangladesh have a simple approach of asking for smoking history on those deaths that have occurred in the past, either through what's called a verbal autopsy, and more recently in South Africa, they have put smoking status, simple question, was dead Fred a smoker five years ago? Yes, no, don't know. And that was uh, responsible for being able to estimate uh, smoking hazards in South Africa. So this is a very practicable strategy that could be adopted worldwide. Thank you.